Welcome to a gripping video that will take you on a chilling journey through three bone-chilling stories of true crime and the supernatural. Prepare to delve into the twisted minds of Derek Todd Lee, John George Hay Jr., and the ghostly legend of Billy Cool. These tales will challenge your understanding of human nature and leave you questioning the boundaries between reality and the unexplained. Derek Todd Lee Investigators examined the terrifying case of a serial killer nicknamed the Ghost of Baton Rouge. A predator who stalked, beat, and savagely murdered six women in a 60-mile radius surrounding the state capital of Louisiana. This savage criminal evaded the manhunt for nearly two years, until a small-time police force took a bold gamble and brought the murderer to justice. On Stanford Avenue in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on September 23, 2001, 41-year-old nurse, Gina Green, returned home from a night out with her sister. She tried to go to sleep, but she couldn't completely relax. She confided to her mother she felt extremely uncomfortable being alone. At 3.45 a.m. the security system went off and startled Green out of bed. She checked all the windows and doors, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Nearby, cloaked in darkness, a predator watched, angry that the alarm foiled his plans. But, he would return the following night to execute his sick fantasy. On September 24, 2001, Gina Green was home alone. Somehow a man slipped into her home and confronted her in the hallway. She was taken to her bathroom where she was beaten, raped, and strangled to death. The following afternoon, after Green failed to show up for work, a co-worker stopped by. He discovered her lifeless body in her bedroom and called 911. Homicide detectives arrived on the scene and immediately recognized signs of violent struggles. Gina's earrings and shoes were strewn in different rooms. A clump of hair lay on the floor. Her shorts, cell phone, and purse were missing. Her blouse was collected by detectives and tested for DNA, but there were no matches found in the system. Just days after the murder, investigators located Green's cell phone by a warehouse five miles from her home. They were able to recover her purse and her shorts dumped behind a trash bin. Unfortunately, none of this evidence would lead detectives to any particular suspect. So the case was treated as a one-off murder. Gerlin DeSoto was home alone getting ready to go on a job interview when she heard a knock at the door. The 21-year-old had no idea the man on her front porch was a stalker who had been passing by her house every day. She let him in. Her husband returned home at 7 p.m. and found her body lying in a pool of blood. She had been beaten and stabbed multiple times in a very violent manner. She had also been stomped. Apparently, there were bloody boot prints that were found there as well. Investigators found no evidence of sexual assault. When they looked in the palm of her hand, they were able to see she had broken fingernails and her fist was clenched. They thought maybe she had used it to fight him off. They collected her fingernail clippings to determine whether or not the subject's DNA could be found underneath. Months would pass before law enforcement connected the DNA found under Gerlin DeSoto's fingernails to her killer. Meanwhile, the Baton Rouge Police Department was now dealing with two murders within a span of four months. Another woman had already been marked for death. Charlotte Pace lived just three doors down from Gina Green. Charlotte was so traumatized by Gina's murder that she actually moved to try to get as far away as she could from the scene of the horror. In Baton Rouge, on May 31, 2002, Charlotte returned home from the car wash and was eating a sandwich on the couch when there was a knock at her door. The man on the other side seemed nice, but he had been studying her for months waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. She was attacked, raped, and brutally beaten. It was very savage and extremely violent. Around 2 p.m. Charlotte Pace's roommate came home and made the sickening discovery. Charlotte's nude body was discovered on the floor in her bedroom. Everything was covered in blood. Blood was sprayed all over the place. She was stabbed 81 times between screwdrivers and a knife. In addition, her throat had been slashed all the way across and her skull had been crushed as well. Even though they couldn't connect these crimes, police were worried there may be a serial killer operating in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. By the summer of 2002, 
southern Louisiana was in the midst of yet another killing spree. There were 60 unsolved murders of women in Baton Rouge since 1985. Because of the recent uptake in rapes and homicides, investigators formed a multi-agency homicide task force. The recent killings of three women, Gina Green, Gerlin DeSoto, and Charlotte Pace, had the task force fearing the worst. That being a serial killer was running rampant in Baton Rouge. Based on demographics and victimology, the FBI made a determination that the killer would be a white, 25 to 35 year old male, who was physically fit and strong. The task force actually put together a composite sketch showing a white male with a long nose and a long face. When the sketch went live, tips poured in from all over the region. The task force was inundated with calls. They became bogged down with trying to follow up on them. But there was one particular caller whose statements piqued investigators' curiosity. A tip came in from an individual who stated that he saw a white pickup truck driven by a white male along I-10 between Baton Rouge and Lafayette. The tipster said it looked like a female passenger was dead. He couldn't get the license plate, but he said there was a fish decal on the tailgate. Law enforcement would remain on the lookout for the white pickup. In the meantime, because they had already had the killer's DNA on record, police launched a DNA dragnet. They stopped and swabbed local men in hopes of collecting enough DNA to find a genetic match. They tested 1,000 men, all of them were white males, and none of them were a match. On Jeffrey Broussard Road, Pro Bridge, Louisiana, on July 9, 2002, 46-year-old nurse, Diane Alexander was home getting ready for work. Her husband, a delivery truck driver, was away on a run. There was a knock at the door, the man outside told Alexander he was lost and needed directions. He asked if he could use her phone, but he also asked her if her husband was home, and she said no she was alone. He instantly turned, he did a 180 degrees. He forced his way into the mobile home, grabbed Diane by the throat, and threatened her with a knife. He attempted to rape her, but was unable to sexually perform. Out of frustration and rage, he took a telephone cord, and not only does he beat her but also strangled her as well. Diane Alexander was fighting for her life. Then something unexpected happened. Diane's son, Herman arrived home and the attacker fled. One thing he was able to say is that he wasn't driving a white pickup truck. The unidentified vehicle that he saw was a gold vehicle, it had a sticker that said Hampton, and it also had a dent on the front hood. There was also a beige telephone cord that was hanging out of the window. Paramedics rushed Alexander to the hospital. She was too badly injured to give police a description of her attacker. But, investigators found valuable evidence at the crime scene. There was DNA transfer onto her dress. The DNA would take weeks to analyze. At Briarwood Place, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on July 12, 2002, 44-year-old Pamela Kinnamore returned home from a long day working at her antique shop. Her husband wouldn't be back till late. She drew a bath and began to relax. She was completely unaware that she left her house keys in the back door. At approximately 11.45, Byron Kinnamore arrived at his home, he fully expected to be greeted by his wife, Pamela, and yet when he entered through the door it was eerily silent. He looked around the house, but couldn't find Pamela. He walked into the bathroom, and he saw the bathtub full of water, but no body. He walked into their bedroom and there he began to notice spots of blood, he started to notice the room itself was slightly disheveled, something was terribly wrong. Police launched a missing persons investigation, but four days later just west of Baton Rouge a survey crew found a badly decomposed, nude body in the water underneath Whiskey Bay Bridge. The body was identified as Pamela Kinnamore. She had been raped, her throat was slit open, and she had been strangled. A few hundred feet from Pamela's body, detectives found a beige telephone cord. This is the same telephone cord that was cut from Diane Alexander's home. The DNA that was recovered from Pamela's body matched the DNA from three other murders. On July 15, 2002, Diane Alexander was finally able to give the detectives a very comprehensive, extremely detailed description of the suspect. 
he had neatly trimmed hair, a pencil-thin mustache, and most critically, he was African-American. A composite sketch was generated by law enforcement where Alexander lived. He was a sharp contrast to the FBI profile, which predicted that the suspect was a white male. But it would take several months for the new sketch to make its way into the hands of task force investigators. For the time being the attack on Diane Alexander was being treated as an unrelated crime. By the fall of 2002, DNA testing linked a single killer to the brutal murders of four women in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. As the investigation dragged on, panic ensued in Baton Rouge. Many women were afraid to go out at night. Everybody was in a high state of alert. There was pepper spray being sold, defense items being sold, and guns being bought. Making matters worse, the police task force was not collaborating with the local police in Zachary, Louisiana which had been tracking these killings since the beginning. Although the task force seemed to be holding on to the impression that a white male had been committing these serial rapes, the fact was that the Zachary Police Department believed that the same African-American male that committed crimes against Diane Alexander was actually responsible for all of these rapes and murders. For the Zachary Police Department, one name topped the short list of suspects, Derek Todd Lee. He had a history of peeping, and breaking and entering in that particular area. Zachary police were convinced that he was a serial killer on the loose. But who exactly was this man? He was a big man, he was 6 feet 1 inch, about 210 to 220 pounds, physically fit, very imposing, and yet that's not the aura which he generated. Nobody came away with the impression that he was capable of being sadistic, mean, or brutally violent. Lee had a very low IQ, he was a loner. His stepfather, unfortunately, was a very harsh disciplinarian. His stepfather was very much centered on Bible studies and corporal punishment. He dropped out of high school and drifted from job to job throughout the 80s. In 1988, Derek Todd Lee married Jacqueline Sims. He became the father of two kids and provided for them, but on the other hand he had a dark side that he was hiding. He was actually doing crimes like peeping and torturing dogs and cats. He was beating his wife and he violated her protective order. He was not the man he presented himself to be. In the 90s, Lee spent time in and out of prison for crimes ranging from trespassing to burglary to stalking. With his checkered background, Derek Todd Lee seemed like exactly the kind of person who could perpetrate these heinous murders. On West Gardner Street, Grand Coteau, Louisiana, on November 21, 2002, 23-year-old Trinesha Column was at St. Charles Borromeo Cemetery visiting her mother's grave side. Afterwards she returned to her car and was never seen again. The following morning Column's wallet and ID were found inside her car, which was still in the exact place where she parked it. Just two days later her body was found by a hunter in a wooded area. She was beaten and raped and murdered. Forensic pathologists took DNA swabs and were able to match those DNA swabs with the other recent killings. Column was murder victim number five connected by DNA to the same killer. Lieutenant David McDavid of Zachary Police Department remained convinced the perpetrator was Derek Todd Lee. In Zachary, Louisiana, a suburb 14 miles northeast of Baton Rouge, there were a series of unsolved homicides that McDavid strongly believed were committed by Lee. On August 23, 1992, Connie Warner vanished from her home. Eleven days later her body was discovered in a ditch by a truck driver. On April 18, 1998, 28-year-old Randy Mabror was snatched away from her home. Her body would never be found. Zachary police questioned Derek Toddley in both cases. There was not enough substantial evidence that linked him to any of those incidents, therefore they couldn't charge him with any of those crimes. Lieutenant McDavid failed to convince his fellow officers that Lee killed then, and that he was killing now. The lack of cooperation between law enforcement agencies caused the investigation to stall. But the killer was still active. Trolling for his next victim. On Dawson Avenue, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on March 3, 2003, Carrie Lynn Yoder, a 26-year-old doctoral student at LSU returned home from running errands. She called her boyfriend just to talk, 
and it was the last time she had been heard from. Two days later, after Terry Lynn failed to answer her phone or return calls, her boyfriend stopped by her house. When he arrived he found the back door open, he walked inside and he saw blood on her purse, which was still there, and he found some objects that were slightly askew. The search for Terry Lynn Yoder ended just 10 days later in a place that already was familiar to homicide detectives. A commercial fisherman discovered her badly decomposed body only 10 yards from where Pamela Kinnamore's body was discovered in Whiskey Bay. The same dumping location. When the DNA analysis came back, it matched the profile of the other six victims. Even though they had been investigating crimes for more than nine months, law enforcement didn't have a single suspect in custody. But their luck was about to change. In April 2003, Zachary P.D. received a complaint from a woman who was jogging who said she felt that she was being stalked. They went to her residence and they found boot prints right by her window. Those prints were very consistent with an individual who was standing outside her window looking into the window. Police figured that their local peeping Tom, Derek Toddley, might be in action again. Fearing Lee had marked his next victim, the Zachary police chief made a bold move. Without notifying the task force, he got a court order to collect a DNA sample from Derek Todd Lee. On Highway 61, in St. Francisville, Louisiana, on May 5, 2003, police visited Lee at his house. They swabbed his mouth for DNA and immediately sent a sample to the state crime lab. Amazingly, the DNA from Derek Todd Lee matched all six murders. Police moved in to make an arrest. The police did not keep a very tight surveillance on Lee, and when they went to his house to arrest him, he was gone. The suspected killer of six women was now a fugitive. The FBI announced a nationwide manhunt for Lee. On May 26, 2003, Lee called a woman he knew in Baton Rouge. Investigators were able to trace the call to a phone in Atlanta, Georgia. The police immediately released the picture of Derek Todd Lee. There was an initial tip that came in that he was staying in a motel. Police executed a search, but he was nowhere to be found. The hunt for Lee went on. Two days later law enforcement got a tip that he might be at a local tire shop. They rushed in there, and looked to no avail. They didn't find him in there, however, one of the members of the fugitive task force had the idea to look beyond the perimeter they had set up. And who do they see? Derek Toddley standing there taking to a woman. Most probably she would have been his very next victim. Lee was quickly apprehended. He was immediately transferred back to Baton Rouge and charged with the murders of six women. Lee pled not guilty to all charges. Prior to trial, Lee's defense team presented arguments that their client was not mentally competent to stand trial. Psychological testing was performed. He was pegged with an IQ of approximately 65. Even though an IQ that low is often classified as mild mental retardation, a judge found Lee competent to stand trial. He was going to be tried separately for each of the six murders. The first trial, on August 6, 2004, was for the murder of Gerald DeSoto. The trial lasted just five days and revolved around DNA evidence linking Lee to the crime. On August 10, the jury took less than two hours to secure a conviction. For the murder of DeSoto, Lee received life in prison. One month later, he was back in court, facing first-degree murder charges for the killing of Charlotte Pace. The death penalty was on the table. This time, in addition to DNA, prosecutors have a special weapon. The lone woman to survive one of Lee's alleged acts. Diane Alexander would become the voice for all the voiceless women. The prosecution's case was so solid that the defense did not call one cinch witness. On October 12th, a jury found Lee guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Derek Todd Lee became a serial killer because it was his choice. He had a hard life, but the fact is he was fantasizing about raping and killing women. He waited until he had the ability to carry it out. Though he wasn't the most intelligent guy on the block, he knew enough to avoid detection, he knew enough to get away unnoticed, and he knew enough how to rape and kill women. 
Derek Todd Lee died on January 21, 2016, of heart disease at a hospital in Louisiana, where he was transported for treatment from Louisiana State Penitentiary, where he had been waiting execution. John George Hay Before being dubbed the vampiric acid bath murderer, his birth name was John George Hay. John was born Saturday, July 24, 1909 in Stamford, Lincolnshire, England to parents John and Emily Hay. Even though he was born in Stamford, he grew up in a nearby village called Outwood in West Yorkshire. His parents were part of a local religious group called Plymouth Brethren. His parents believed that the outside world was evil so John's father built a 10 feet 3 meters high fence to keep the evil out. So the only friends John had growing up were the few pets that he had growing up and the neighbor's dog when he would have to take care of it for them. As a child his parents were very religious and strict so they would pound it into his head that there was a higher spiritual figure watching him at all times with a disapproving watch. Because his parents were so religious and strict with him he would have recurring nightmares of trees turning into crucifixes and weeping blood. John's father had a bluish blemish on his head and he was always told he got it because he sinned when he was young and it was his way of being punished to be marked a sinner. He believed because his mom had not received a mark that she was an angel and pure. He realized as he was growing up that he might be special, invincible almost because he would commit little sins like lying or having a questionable behavior and never received a mark. In 1934, at the age of 25, John left his parents' church and got married to a 21-year-old woman by the name of Beatrice Hamer. They hadn't known each other very long, and she was unsure of his character, but he was always charming, well-dressed and had manners, which counted for a lot then. They were married on Friday, July 6, 1934 and then moved in with John's parents. For months after they were married, John was arrested for fraud. Beatrice, while John was in prison, gave birth to a baby girl which she put up for adoption. Beatrice saw John one more time before their marriage ended. On this meeting he told her that their marriage was not official because he was still married to another woman, this was untrue. John was released after a few months and wound up committing small-time scams to live day-to-day. -day. In 1936 he decided to move to London. He became a chauffeur for William McSwan owner of an amusement park. He would also do secretarial work for William. In 1937, after he left the chauffeur job, John was again arrested and charged for fraud. He had been taking money from people and promising products and services in return of advance payment. He received four years and was released in 1940 because the war caused authorities to allow early release of non-violent offenders for a chance to get drafted. By 1943, John had managed to swindle enough money from small-time schemes to move to room 404 in a high-end hotel called the Onslow Court Hotel in South Kensington, London. In 1944 John met up with his old boss William McSwan. By now he had rented a basement workshop at 79 Gloucester Road in Kensington. He turned it into his death room. He conceived ideas about disposing of bodies in acid when he worked using sulfuric acid in the jail's tin shop. He would test the effects of acid on mice and studied the outcome. It was Saturday, September 9, 1944 when John had managed to lure William's son Donald to his workshop where he hit him over the head with a blunt object and then proceeded to slit his throat. In his diary, regarding Donald's death, he wrote I got a mug and took some blood from his neck in the mug and drank it. He found a 40-gallon drum and put Donald's body in it. He then poured sulfuric acid over the body covered it and left it overnight to dissolve. After he left he went home to bed. He later claimed that after he had realized he actually killed someone, he started to have the same nightmares that plagued him as a child. He came back to his workshop the next day and dumped the liquid sludge that used to be Donald McSwan into a drain out back of his workshop. He felt overwhelmed with happiness when he dumped the sludge down the drain because he strongly felt that him doing this would make it so he never got caught. Donald's parents had started to get worried when their son hadn't been seen in a few days so they asked John if he knew anything. He told them that Donald had fled to Ireland to escape being drafted into the army and would send fake postcards to Donald's parents. John knew that would only hold them off for a while. 
They became worried when they heard the end of the war was near and they hadn't seen Donald since he left for Ireland so abruptly, so they asked John again if he knew anything. He then knew they had to go. He managed to get their trust enough to get them to come to his workshop and that is where he hit them in the head with a blunt object and dissolved their bodies in acid. He claimed that he again drank their blood before he killed them. He disposed of their remains the next day and started work on forging transfer deeds for property that the McSwans owned. He was able to obtain the properties the McSwans owned but spent all the money he made on a betting system he devised for the dog track. He decided to go back to murdering the rich and taking their money after he dissolved the bodies. In August 1947 a house went on the market owned by Dr. Archibald Henderson and his wife Rosalie. John, who was broke, started to work a deal on a price for the house. He would tell them that he had a business deal fall through and he would not be able to buy the house right away, that he would buy it with payment installations all a part of his big master plan to rob and kill these people who had no idea what they were about to get themselves into. After a few meetings they became friends. John had a charm about him that he was able to make people feel safe or sit easy when he was around. Thursday, February 12, 1948, John drove Archibald to his workshop under the pretense that he wanted to show Mr. Henderson something he had been working on. Once in the workshop John took a different approach in killing his next victim. He shot the doctor in the back of the head and dumped his body in a vat of sulfuric acid. He left to get the doctor's wife. He got back to the Henderson house and told Rosalie that her husband has fallen ill and asked for her to go to him. Off they went to John's workshop. Again, as they got inside he shot her in the back of the head and disposed of her body the same way that her husband's body was. He then forged documents and letters to the servants, family and friends saying that they had moved to another country and Mr. Hay would take care of all their stuff. Once he made enough money from selling off all the Henderson stuff, he lost it all to quite a few bookies. In 1949 it was getting rough for John. He owed money to the bank, he owed back rent at the hotel he stayed at, and the management was getting tired of waiting for their money. So he was getting really desperate to get a hold of some money when he was sitting down to dinner in the hotel's dining room and sitting across from him was a widowed woman by the name of Olivia Duran Deacon. The two of them had talked a bit about how he rents and leases high-end cars to wealthy people, and how that she knew he was a businessman and might be able to help her promote an idea she had for manufacturing plastic fingernails to sell in stores. John liked the setup for his next victim and asked her to go to his workshop to further discuss plans to get this idea of hers onto paper. John got the widow to his workshop, and yet again once inside he shot her in the back of the head, stripped her body as he did with the other victims, and put her body into a 40-gallon vat of sulfuric acid. Once it was fully dissolved he disposed of the liquids down the sewer drain and poured the solid waste, which was nothing more than sludge, onto the dirt in the backyard. In later questioning he told police that during the process of draining the vats and scraping out the sludge he took a break and went to a restaurant nearby called Ye Old Ancient Priors Restaurant where he had an egg on toast. He didn't make much off of this killing but managed to sell off enough stuff to pay his back rent to the hotel and other bills that needed to get paid. He then went to look for another victim. A little while after he killed Mrs. Duran Deacon he felt he should make inquiries into her not being around much to avoid anyone questioning him. He was one of the last ones seen talking to her. He went to talk to one of the widow's closest friends Mrs. Constance Lane. He had asked her if she had talked to Olivia and Mrs. Lane mentioned that Olivia had told her that she was supposed to go to his workshop and this kind of shocked John. He told her that he never took Olivia to his workshop and she mentioned about talking to someone to help look into where she might be. She could have gotten suspicious at any point so John said that he would go to the police station with her to file a report. They walked into the police station and one of the cops recognized John and checked out his background. He raised some suspicion with the officers so they brought him in for questioning on Monday, February 28, 1949. John first denied having any ties to Mrs. Duran Deacon's disappearance but when he was told about what the investigators found at his workshop he shouted Mrs. Duran Deacon no longer exists. I've destroyed her with acid, you can't prove murder without a body. He misunderstood the term corpus delecti thinking it meant that without a body there is no proof of murder, but there was still a body of murder. 
When John had denied his involvement in Mrs. Durandekin's disappearance, the officers that had John Hay's record felt something was fishy, so they went to John's workshop and hotel room to search around to see if they could find any kind of smoking gun. When they were at John's workshop, they found Mrs. Durandekin's gruesome remains, with just enough to make a proper identification. They found most of her remains hardened in the backyard into a sludgy compound. They also found 28 pounds of human fat that had been displaced over the backyard, partially corroded bones of a human foot, the widow's plastic handbag that had not succumbed to the acid, a plastic lipstick container cap, a full upper denture, three human gallstones and certain bones that were visible enough to realize it was female bones. When the investigators searched John's hotel room, they found a diary with abbreviated descriptions of his other murders, some personal items of the McSwan and Henderson families. Monday, July 18, 1949 John Hay was charged with Mrs. Durandekin's murder on one on trial. He would try and make it his big call to make everyone think he was insane. When he was originally arrested on murder charges he had asked what would happen to him in the long run if he were to plead or make it look like he was insane. While incarcerated in prison he kept the charade up of his insanity by drinking his own urine and various other questionable acts that would make him seem insane. When it came time for his trial, a psychiatrist was put on the stand to testify that he had given John an evaluation and had tested him and he had found that because of John's childhood experiences he felt that John had become paranoiac and that he had probably drank the blood from his victims. When the prosecutor was questioning the psychiatrist regarding John's plea of insanity the doctor said John knew that his crimes were wrong, throwing John's chances of pleading insanity right out the window. It took the jury 15 minutes to come to the verdict of guilty, and with that John was sentenced to death. Saturday, August 6, 1949 at Wandsworth Prison, John was hanged for his crimes and this ended the acid bath murderer's reign of terror. In the end of it all the only real thing people still have a hard time understanding is how much he John really got from each murder. No real researched amount has been found, but it is still a big dispute as to how much he really made off of each victim. Billy Cole William Billy F. Cole was born on February 6, 1873 in Germany, but his serial murders were committed in the United States between 1902 and 1910. Before relocating to Washington, where his killings would occur, he lived in the Yukon where he had made his living as a bartender. He moved to Aberdeen, Washington where he got work at the Sailors Union of the Pacific as a union official. By the time he arrived in Washington, he was already a polished lawbreaker. Police suspected Cole of being liable for the majority of the multitude of corpses of vagrant laborers that they discovered floating toward shore during his term of employment as a bartender. They were also suspicious of Cole's involvement in a copious amount of other crimes. Cole greatly abused his power of authority as a union official. He benefited from his reputation and his intimidating stature to repress strikes within the union as well as to recruit new members to the union. It was during his time of employment at the union that he realized the union building's potential for great victim clientele. The union building turned out to be not only a convenient location to produce victims and commit crimes, but also to cloak the evidence that a crime had been committed. Not long after sailors arrived at the Aberdeen port, they would venture to the Sailors' Union building where they could gather their mail and, if they felt so inclined, they could put money into their savings. It was these services that Cole found advantageous considering he was frequently unaccompanied on the job. When interacting with the sailors, Cole would inquire about the presence of any relatives or acquaintances nearby. He would steer the conversation to the matter of wages and items of value. Cole considered three things when selecting his next victims. If he established that the sailor was only temporarily stopping through Aberdeen, if he had no relatives or acquaintances close by, and if the sailor was in possession of more than petty cash or treasures on his person at that time, Cole had found his next victim. Cole did not travel very far to commit his murders. In fact, nearly all of his victims were shot dead in the Union building. After Cole had alleviated the valuable properties from the corpse, he would discard the bodies into the Wishka River which conveniently flowed in the rear of the Union building and ebbed into Grays Harbor. Located in the Union building was a slope that began inside and ended in the Wishka River. 
despite the fact that police suspected that Gull was accountable for the slew of dead bodies of sailors who had temporarily docked in Aberdeen and subsequently vanished, police did nothing to prevent possible future killings. Billy Gull was not stopped until a co-conspirator named John Klingenberg was transported back to Aberdeen after having attempted to flee to Mexico to avoid prosecution. Though, some believed, he vanished to get away from Billy Cole. Klingenberg was able to attest to the police that he had observed Cole alone with a sailor named Charles Hatberg, whose corpse had been ascertained by the police in the Indian Creek Harbor on February 2, 1910, not long after he had disappeared. Hatberg had been on the receiving end of a fatal gunshot from a .38 automatic pistol. The gun was located in proximity to his corpse and police trailed the ownership to Billy Cole. In February 1910, Cole was arrested for Charles Hatberg's murder and was found guilty of two counts of murder, though he was the suspect in at least 41 more. The second count of murder for which he was convicted was that of John Hoffman. Hoffman was a witness to the murder of Charles Hatberg. Cole shot and wounded Hoffman on the day that Hatberg was murdered. Klingenberg murdered Hoffman the next day, a crime for which he received a 20-year sentence. John Hoffman was murdered on December 23, 1909 and, true to Cole's modus operandi, he was dumped in the water. His body was found in the same body of water where Hatberg's body had been located. He was found in the Indian Creek Harbor. In July 1910, human bones were discovered in the Indian Creek Harbor, but it was never concluded that it was the skeleton of John Hoffman. The last time anyone saw Cole's final victim, he was entering the Union Building. Cole unknowingly implicated himself when the police found the body of the man and Cole had incorrectly identified him. The victim, a man named Fred Nielsen, was wearing a watch that had August Schlitter inscribed on the back. Before Cole disposed of the body, he had seen this inscription and surmised that it was the victim's name. Cole returned the watch to the victim before unloading the body and, when asked about the victim after the body had been found, he declared that the man's name was Schlitter. Police were aware that the inscription on the back of the watch was not the victim's name but the name of the watchmaker. They deduced that only the killer would have seen the inscription and Gall was immediately arrested for murder. In March 1912 police discovered a skull buried adjacent to a cabin that was owned by Billy Gall. Previously, another skull had been discovered nearby the same place. Authorities suspected that it was the skull of Red Miller who had vanished and was thought to be one of Gall's victims. The police found other bodies in Grays Harbor that they imagined were victims of Gaul. The corpse of Carl O. Carlson was unearthed on April 27, 1910 and a skeleton that remained anonymous was found in Indian Creek on July 21, 1910. Exempt from the death penalty by a request of compassion of the jury, he was given the sentence of life in prison on May 12, 1910 after he had been found guilty of the two murders. On June 13, 1910, he was escorted to the state prison. Afterward, he was moved to an asylum for the criminally deranged. He stayed at the asylum, Eastern State Hospital in Spokane County, until he died. Billy Gold died at the age of 54 from pneumonia that had affected several lobes of his lungs and a feverish infectious disease called erysipelas. These illnesses were made worse by the mental deterioration brought on by syphilis. He died on March 3, 1927. Between 1909 and 1912, police had recovered over 41 bodies out of Indian Creek and Grays Harbor. Only a handful of victims were identified by name. The majority of the victims remained nameless and police suspected them to be seamen. Billy Gull never disclosed his true number of victims. As we conclude our journey, we are left with a deep sense of the darkness that can dwell within the human soul. The stories of Derek Toddley, John George Hay Jr. and the haunting legend of Billy Gould gave us a glimpse into the depths of corruption, the horrors that lurk in the shadows, and the unexplained mysteries that still baffle us. These tales serve as a chilling reminder that evil can manifest itself in the most unexpected ways, both in the concrete world and beyond. The legacy of these individuals and the continued presence of Billy Gould remind us to remain vigilant, seek justice, and question the depths of human potential. Thank you for joining us in this unsettling exploration of the human psyche. It is my hope that these stories serve as a cautionary reminder to always be wary of the darkness that may lurk just below the surface, 
waiting to be revealed.